guess who just went on their first business trip since January 2020? Yep, this chick. Hey everybody, welcome to episode number 516 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. This week, my friends, we're talking about VITA, MOSA, SOSA, and probably a couple other acronyms that aren't coming to mind right now. Because this week, I was at the Embedded Tech Trends Conference in Phoenix, Arizona. My guests this week are Dean Holman, President and Executive Director of VITA, and Ken Grob and Mark Littlefield from Elma Electronic. First up, Dean gives us an update about VITA the current open standard revisions and reaffirmations that VITA is working on today, and why the VITA study groups are where the real action takes place. So without further ado, please welcome Dean to Fish Fry. Hi, Dean. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Okay, so Dean, for my audience who may not know, what is VITA all about? So VITA is an international trade association that develops standards. So, you know, Standards Development Organization, SDO, we're under the sanction of ANSI, which is, you know, worldwide. We have policies and procedures that we follow that ANSI has approved that ensure that we have a fair and equitable process for developing open standards. We're membership-based, so we have almost 150 member companies across all continents in the globe. 58 countries right now. We have approximately 4,000 members who are members of those companies. And those members vary in interest levels. Some of them just want to download our published standards. They have a design they need to do or whatnot. Then others want to actively participate in the development of new standards. And then the third category are people who want to kind of just listen in on the development so that they know what the trend is for the industry. So that's what VITA is in a nutshell. So there has been quite a bit of movement in the VITA organization since the last time I met with you guys. So what's new? So we've been getting a lot of new member companies, which is very exciting. And they're in divergent areas. We have some in the autonomous vehicle realm. We've got a lot of them now coming in from the space arena, which I find very exciting. We have Vita 78, which is our space VPX standard, and we're looking to expand on that. NASA, as we just had embedded tech trends out in Chandler, Arizona, and they came and presented on that standard and what they'd like to see enhanced in it. So that's fantastic to have, I mean, NASA, I mean, you can't do much better in space, right? So we have all these new companies that are coming in, and we're looking towards developing the next generation of capabilities. Right now, we have OpenVPX, which is you know, one of the big selling standards in the world. And we're looking at what do we need to do to go to that next level of performance to last into the next century. Okay, so Vita has been working on 11 revisions and two reaffirmations. So first, Dean, what is the difference between a revision and a reaffirmation? And can you give me some details about those reaffirmations? Sure. So when you publish a standard for the very first time, it's good for five years. ANSI policies are every five years you have to review it. And if you want to keep it as is, there are no enhancements or changes, you reaffirm it. You can do that twice, and then you have to decide if you want to put it into stabilized maintenance, which means, yeah, it's good the way it is, and we cannot envision any future changes. It's just a categorization. So that's reaffirmation. Revision is you published a standard some anywhere from six months to 10 years ago, and you've got some enhancements that you want to introduce. New connector capabilities, speeds, or whatnot. So you open it up, and it's just like you're starting a brand new standard. It needs three sponsor companies to open it up, and then you make the changes you want, the working groups vote on it, and then you republish it as a new date. So if the original was first published in 2010, 
you know, this would be you know, Vita blah, 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 2022, for example. So let's talk about your six study groups. That's where the real work happens, right? So in the Vita world, working groups are where actual standards are developed. If you've got a company that comes forward and says, you know, I'd really think that this new capability would be worthy of Vita to take on to develop, but I'm really not sure yet. So we could open up a study group. It's almost like a working group. It still needs sponsorship, but you're not sure yet. So you're going to lay out, here's my plan. This study group will look at the following six characteristics or whatever of the new proposal and determine, yeah, there's a need for this. Then they can convert it to a working group and you're off and running just like any other working group. So why I'm excited is I think six study groups is the largest number we've ever had open. And it's just great because we've got all these new possibilities. You know, we're in 2023 now. The stalwart standards, you know, Vita VME bus, that was 40 years ago, right? So OpenVPX has still got long legs. And, you know, we just had a presentation this morning where we talked about the improvements in the speed that we could introduce to that standard, right? Well, there's going to be a point in which we need the next generation. And one of the working groups is but follow on to OpenVPX. What kind of capabilities can we introduce that'll take us to 2050 or 2060? That's cool. All right, Dean, it's time for your off-the-cuff question. Ooh. Okay, so Dean, since you haven't been on my show before, you get my standard off-the-cuff. So if you could have one meal right now, it doesn't matter if it's across the world, you need a passport to get there, or the restaurant is closed what would you have? I would say Indian. Yeah. Some nice either tiki masala or a nice hot vindaloo. I think that would be fantastic. Yeah. And that sounds delicious. Well, Dean, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Amelia, thanks for having me. Next up, let's dive into the world of Mosa and Sosa with Ken Grob and Mark Littlefield from Elma Electronic. Hi, Ken. Thank you so much for joining me. Great to be here. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay, so first up, let's talk about MOSA and SOSA. So remind my audience what MOSA is all about and the benefits of adopting MOSA. So MOSA was an initiative created by the joint services to modify the way the acquisition community buys systems. And the reason that services sorted this out is that systems were basically too expensive and there was no way for them to be able to upgrade them in a broader community and to support them. So the costs were really getting out of hand and the technology needs were sort of outpacing the ability of the ecosystem to be able to provide solutions. So the services basically figured out, hey, we got to come up with a new way to do this. And this was sort of a relatively large change that they had to promote. And they had to come up with a strategy for that. And then they had to sell that into industry because they need industry to implement it. So the benefits to it are actually good for the whole community on the whole. And I think even the industry partners that will take part in it. Obvious, I think now that there's a lot of folks adopting it within the primes I mean, you might still have a few holdouts, but I think ultimately the strategy is going to win. Okay, so let's talk about SOSA. Now, why do you think SOSA initiatives are so important to the defense community in particular? So SOSA, if you look at how SOSA came about, it got launched sort of from a grassroots effort of other services already doing some of this work under the MOSA umbrella. So one of those was early work that was done by the Army. And I think each branch had its sort of own cultivation of its vertical, where you had host developing its approach to modular open systems. But the Army was one of the early, early services to actually start this work. So then when you look at them rolling their efforts together into SOSA, Sensor Open Systems Architecture, it becomes an implementation that addresses sensors It's actually a little wider than that, because if you look at the plans that the Army has, it involves communication systems, it involves SIGINT, it involves EW, involves different types of radar systems and things like that. But ultimately, the standardization, if you've been following SOSA, will help with cost, interoperability, pluggability, 
multi, say, two, three deep sourcing, faster time to development, faster time to deployment. The strategy enables them to do what they call pace the threat. And if we don't develop equipment quick enough or respond to changing market threat in the world theater, that's a problem. So there's a whole host of reasons to follow through with the adoption. And I think it's really healthy for the whole industry in, in general. So let's talk about the interoperability element here. Why do you think interoperability is so critical within the SOSA ecosystem? Yeah, so interoperability is one of the key drivers. If you want to have too deep sourcing, then the cards have to work, let's say, between the packaging. So when you think about it, there is no SOSA chassis per se, but there are enough rules to set up an environment where you can have a backplane where you'll plug in cards from the, into the same slot from multiple vendors. So then those cards have to operate when they're plugged into that slot with whatever payload and whatever switch is involved in that chassis. And however, those, that backplane, the backplane could be done from multiple vendors also. So you end up with the need to have enough discipline to create rules that will get you to an interoperable environment. And that's a lot harder than it initially sounds. There's other issues besides just whether the physical interfaces align. Then you have how they interact. And then you also have a lot of nuances. And then you may get up into some things that have to do with like the protocols that are used to start a system and have cards either discover each other or communicate using like management schemes for say starting and things like that. So they all have to behave the same way. So there's a lot to it. It's a lofty goal. I think we're on the right path. (laughs) I'm not going to say we're there, (laughs) but it's certainly a great thing to work towards. So what is ELMA in particular doing in this arena? So ELMA's been involved with the standards since the beginning of SOSA and actually before that in CMOS. So some of our goals are to provide reference chassis and reference environments that help the industry have if there's a, something like a gold standard or a known. Um, well, what we do is try to work with the customer base, which is in this case is the, are the primes and military directly. So as you build, well, you have to reviews, plug fests and plug tests, begin to set up a baseline. And then you have the military itself. Today I talked about the PNT Oil Laboratory, which is a great place that you have easy access to go to do these integration tests and interoperability tests, if you will, because their test writs that they develop cause a standard set of tests to run different cards through, and they all have to basically pass those same tests. At that point, you're starting to push yourself into like the first stages of interoperability because you're testing to see if everybody can do the same thing. So We've been involved fairly proactively in trying to create early reference backplanes and chassis that assist the pick vendors and having a place to plug their cards in where they can test their cards against other cards and amongst themselves, say their own products, and then they have to go outside their own environment and work with the rest of the folks that are making cards in the manufacturing base. So that's one of the things we're doing. We're also working in chassis management. We have a fairly strong position in chassis management. Our chassis management solutions do similar things. We'll ring them out, and then we'll have other people start testing against them, find bugs, fix them. And over time, what we start to do is build something somewhat normalized to what the functions are that people have to do. And that gives folks a reference, and I think that helps with the whole interoperability mission or the premise. Next up is Mark Littlefield from Elma. Thank you so much for joining me, Mark. Well, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Okay, so Mark, you presented a session at the Embedded Tech Trends Conference this year called The Value of SOSA Beyond the U.S. Military. So tell me a bit about that, Mark. So I talk with a lot of people, both uh, in industry here in the U.S. and in, you know, overseas in Europe and Asia. And one of the things I hear is, my customer's not interested in SOSA, so why should I? Or I hear, we're European, SOSA is an American military thing, so why do we care about that? Well, SOSA is an architecture and is driving the design of components, specifically hardware, because hardware is the most mature of the SOSA elements. And we're now, what I was just calculating, we're over four years since the first SOSA hardware started shipping. 
So it's quite mature as a market. And why not take advantage of the advantages that Sosa hardware brings to make it easier to integrate, to make it easier to replace hardware, to do technology upgrades and so on. And so that's what I'm trying to communicate to the community is there's real value here. You don't have to adhere to every rule in the Sosa standard to get good benefit from it. That makes sense. All right, Mark, it's time for your off-the-cuff question. All right, shoot. So I've been to at least five Embedded Tech Trends conferences so far. I'm not sure how many you've been to, Mark, but where has been your favorite location for ETT? Oh, I don't know. San Diego was pretty good. I thought that was a good venue, and I I met a lot of good people who I didn't know. So I thought San Diego. Awesome. Well, it was a pleasure speaking with you again, Mark. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. All right, so if you want even more information about SOSA, the Embedded Tech Trends Conference, or Elma Electronic, I've included a bunch of links below the player on this week's Fish Frying page on eejournal.com and in the YouTube description for this episode as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash eejournal. If you're into Twitter, you can monitor our tweets at eejournaltfm. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal Twitter account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, sure, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. And you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, by clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Frying page, you can subscribe to this here podcast through Spotify, Podbean, or Apple Podcasts. And remember, if you'd like to further support this podcast, please leave me a review on that podcasting platform of your choice. And remember, if you'd like any further information about the stories covered in today's show, just head on over to eejournal.com and look for this week's Fish Frying page. Thank you everyone for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com or post a comment on our forums on eejournal. For the week of January 27th, 2023, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.